Siberia. A camp for Japanese prisoners of war. December 31st, 1950. Among the prisoners in this prisoner of war camp was Ichiku Kubota, a young painter. Despite the severe conditions of captivity, his talent was very much in demand. The master told me personally that a soldier asked him to paint a woman, and he did it by observing her through binoculars. Kubota visited the soldier every evening and sketched the woman. He said he was paid in money and thick potato peelings, which he and the other prisoners cooked and ate. Well, how's it going? Is it ready? In fact, the prisoners and guards shared their imprisonment because they were together all the time. In the absence of females, any picture of a naked woman sketched by Kubota became an excellent present for a camp guard on New Year's Eve. If only had known how famous the artist would become years later. We are dealing with a visionary a genius who revolutionized the ancient art of the traditional kimono. He revised and renewed it. He gave it a new dimension that made it even more artistic. Even in today's Japan, there's no one comparable to him. This genius was in possession of a mystery. No one, not even his closest friends, knew the secret of his fantastic technique. I think there was some secret. Of course, it's not for me to judge, but the master himself seemed tormented by it. After all, this craftsmanship might have fallen into someone else's hands. Ichiko Kubota never revealed his secret. Only once did the master mention by mistake that during one of the most dramatic periods of his life, he had had a vision which became the basis of his unique technique. Pieces of ice are tumbling, a curtain of snow in small patterns. The author of this haiku is the famous Japanese poet Matsuo Basho. He wrote in the 17th century, nearly 400 years before the artist's birth. During his time, a sad event took place. Tsujigahana, the art of coloring relief textiles, was declared illegal, and all knowledge of how to do it disappeared. Centuries later, Ichiku Kubota revived the old master's unique technique. It is as if Basho's haikus gained something eternal on his canvases, his kimonos. In the picturesque town of Fuji Kawaguchiko, at the foot of Mount Fujiyama, there's a unique treasure trove nestled in the landscape. When you cross the threshold of this temple of art, you begin to feel at one with nature. The architecture of the museum is a work of art in itself, a harmonious synthesis of many different ideas. Ichiku Kubota built his workshop, now a museum, using only local materials. Examining the details, you can discover an amazing amalgamation of cultures, but the most striking element lies deeper inside. This pyramid is home to a gloriously splendid collection of handmade artworks. Many visitors have said that after spending many hours in front of the kimonos, they were seized by an entire range of emotions. Some even sobbed. All your senses are exposed and alert. You can sense the fragrance of the garden, the rush of water, the beauty of the kimonos, 
you can almost touch it. And it becomes an unforgettable experience for both art historians and ordinary museum visitors. For me, seeing the Kubota collection for the first time, what struck me was the light. I had never seen light captured in any form of art in such a way as were captured on these stunning textiles, on these kimonos. It is no surprise that respected experts call Ichiku Kubota the world's only impressionist on textiles. His daring solutions allowed him to combine what the Japanese viewed as incompatible. What is the secret? How did Kubota achieve his effects? He was creating it as an entire work of art, even though there were many individual paintings. They were all meant to relate one to the other. And that, to me, is as much of an accomplishment as, as Monet and his famous uh, Water Lily series. In my opinion, among all the world's painters I've seen, only Picasso's works have left such a deep impression. I'd compare him with the Russian artist Mikhail Vrubel, who possesses that very vibration of small details, like in a mosaic, which makes the entire presentation. Viewed very closely, you can see the tiniest details, and stepping away, the artwork appears to soar. There are features in common with Cézanne's Montagne Sainte-Victoire, which he drew from various perspectives, and with Klimt and Viennese secessionist art. Kubota was certainly an artist who, like most Japanese craftsmen and artists, turned to nature. But I think it's coming more from a syncretism between his interests and his eye and his emotions and the Impressionists than a copying or imitation. I don't think that's what's going on. I think it's a, a parallel track. During his creative years, Kubota produced hundreds of unique pieces of art. Here is The Universe, probably his major work, the apotheosis of his creativity. It's an amazing sight. Scores of splendid kimonos merge into one opulent picture, and as you plunge into the depths of the universe, you suddenly find yourself in the contours and outlines of the unfinished part of his fantastic work. But there is no discord between the splendor and austerity of the contours. Thirteen black and white sketches explain the rest of the journey Kubota envisaged and take you to the source of his universe.